Hi, I'm Ben. I work on the React team. And uh, today I just want to talk about you know, what we're thinking about for what's next for React. And so when we think about how we can improve React and new problems that we can solve, we're really trying to answer one question. And that's, how can React help make great apps? Um, and now, when we think about this, there's actually two parts of this. The first one, I think, is relatively obvious, which is that uh, in order to make great apps, the product of your work has to be great and feel really amazing. And so you need to have a great user experience. But we also think that the developer experience is incredibly important and uh, makes a huge difference in uh, how you're developing apps. So I'm going to talk about both of these today. And so first, I want to talk about a few different uh, things that we're looking at for user experience. Um, and before I go any further, I want to just say, basically everything I'm going to talk about today is just an idea. And we haven't written any code for it. We might not write any code for it. Uh, and th these are all things that we do want to implement. Um, but we're a small team. It'll take us a while to get to all of it. So it's even better if all of you can do all this stuff, uh, and then we can, and then we won't have to. So just keep that in mind, and uh, hopefully, hopefully some of you can be inspired by this. And so first, I want to talk about animations. Now, animations are super uh, important uh, for creating a polished apps. They're one of the first uh, pieces of polish that people try to, uh, try to do when uh, trying to make a high-quality app. Um, and you know, there's different kinds of animations. Some of them are just like the blink tag or the marquee tag. And those maybe aren't super helpful to the user. Uh, but animations are also really important um, and help you uh, uh, reason about where you are in the app. Because our brains are super good at spatial reasoning. And animations help you uh, get a feel for where you are. And this is extra important on mobile devices, which have small screens. And so you have less context around you. Now, animations are something that as soon as we released React, people started asking us, you know, what's the best way to do animations in React? Um, and if you actually look at React, uh, it makes sense why people were asking this. And that's uh, that React is all about, you know, you have some state A and state B, and you just tell React what you want to render in state A and what you want to render in state B. And React takes care of the transition of t creating the appropriate views or destroying the, uh, the views. And you don't have to think about that. But animations are all about the transition. And you know, so there, there's a, now a, a few uh, different libraries that have popped up. And uh, I think we're actually getting to a pretty good place with uh, animations now. We have uh, React Transition Group and React Motion, which are great if you want to have uh, lists of items that animate in and out. Um, we also have a, um, a great library called Animated, which is on React Native. Um, it's not even a separate library. It's just part of. Uh, part of React Native. And the key insight that Animated has is that your views can still be declarative based on what your state is and say exactly what you want to, uh, to render in any given state. The key is that now your state can be changing continuously over time as well. And so the way you use Animated, it's super simple. You can just say animated.view, and you write exactly what you want the style to be. Um, and one, uh, one thing that we did is this.state.width in this example is not actually a real number. It's a special object which we call an animated.value. So when you're initializing it, you need to create this new animated.value. Uh, and then you can call different methods on, with it. You can call animated.spring and just say what you want it to transition to. Uh, but the way we've set up this API, we can actually run these animations entirely off thread. So it doesn't matter what your JavaScript's doing. The animation can keep going. Um, and this animation uh, API is also really flexible. And you can use it uh, not just for fire and forget animations, but if, you're, if you want an animation to track your finger as you're dragging across the screen, um, then it can also do that in a really efficient way. And so we want to bring this to React DOM so that you can also use it on the web. Uh, but other than that, we're actually in a pretty good place for animations. Uh, but animations, you know, like I just said, ties really in closely to gestures. And this is something uh, where we're not as good at a place in. And this is actually something that's often overlooked when people build applications, um, and uh, especially on mobile web. And this is one of the, the biggest things that makes a difference between apps that feel native and feel really good in your fingers and uh, apps that feel webby and kind of gross. Uh, <laughs> and so as an example, let's just look at this Apple Maps app. Now, it looks pretty simple, um, and it feels pretty simple when you interact with it. Uh, but if you look at all the gestures that are happening here, there's a bunch. So um, you can 
put your finger down and drag across the screen to move the map and pan it around. You can put two fingers down and move them closer together or farther apart to zoom in or out. You can tap on something on the map, like on the red pin, to see more information about it. You can double tap to zoom in. You can press and hold to drop a new pin. Um, and there's actually even like a couple others that I didn't put on there. Um, now, when you put these all together, this actually feels really great, uh, but this is very complicated to build out if you don't have the proper abstractions. And uh, in fact, on the web, it's basically impossible to just build this using uh, touch start, touch move, and touch end because it's just not the hooks you, you want and you want to have uh, a real gesture system on top of that that can interpret the user's uh, finger movements and figure out what, what they're trying to do. And so uh, we think this is super important. We want there to be a good gesture system for React where we have a simple uh, component API where it's super easy to add gestures right into the tree of your components, um, staying within the React model. We also want it to be uh, written entirely in JavaScript because on React Native, uh, we could interface with the existing iOS and Android gesture systems, uh, but then you need to worry about differences cross-platform and it also wouldn't work on mobile web. And so uh, we'd rather implement it in pure JavaScript so that, uh, so that you can have the same gesture system across, across every platform, including on the web, and then you can make web apps that also feel really, really good. The third piece of user experience I wanna talk about is performance. And specifically, I wanna talk about one piece of performance, uh, which is making lists fast. Um, and you know, if you're a web developer, you might be like, why lists? Um, I think mobile developers here will get it a little more, but if you actually look at almost any mobile app on your phone, it, they're all made up of lists. If you look at like your mail client or messages or your calendar, you're scrolling through your events or your phone book or you're browsing your photos or you know, you're searching for something or even just going to the settings screen, those are all lists of stuff. Um, and so this is one thing that we think is super important to, uh, to make fast in React. And so there's uh, three techniques I wanna talk about for this. The first one uh, we call windowing, which is just only rendering the things that are on screen. Now, it sounds pretty obvious when I say it like that, I think, uh, that, yeah, why would you waste time rendering things that are off screen or below the fold? Uh, but this is something that's not super easy in the React model right now. You sort of have to step outside of it um, and we have some abstractions for this, but uh, they're, they're not as, as performant as they could be. Uh, the second idea we have is rendering in chunks. And so when you're using an application, if you're scrolling through a list and a new item comes on screen, then depending on the complexity of that item, if it's a very complex thing, like if you're scrolling through your Facebook feed and there's a new story that has you know, the author and their name and the date and a photo, and, or maybe it's a video, and then you have like and comment and share, you, know, you ha have dozens of views that need to come on screen. Um, and this can take you know, 50 milliseconds, this can take 100 milliseconds, and in that time, the scroll's going to be janky and the app's gonna be unresponsive. So one idea we have is that if you could render in chunks, and so uh, if React can render part of that new item that's coming on screen, and then basically pause and give, uh, you know, let the scrolling continue, uh, keep the app responsive, and then resume its work and cut that up across multiple frames, then your app uh, can stay responsive throughout the whole thing. Now, uh, the third piece of performance I wanna talk about that we wanna do is uh, improving layout, and so, you know, when you're profiling uh, any web app, really, um, if you look in the Chrome timeline and you do a profile, you'll see these little tr red triangles. Uh, if you hover over it, it says forced reflow. And what that means is that you change the style of some element, and then immediately after that, you ask the browser, hey, what's the position of this, or what's the, what's the size of this? And when you ask that, the browser is forced to recompute the layout right then and run the whole layout algorithm. Um, and this is especially bad if you're doing this in a tight loop, if you're changing something and then reading the layout and changing something else and reading the layout of that. Um, and the browser has to redo the layout dozens of times. Now, React actually does a pretty good job, uh, by default, uh, helping you with this problem. It's actually pretty hard to uh, accidentally create a big loop of these layout reflows in React, um, but there are a couple cases where this still happens. Now, 
One example is if you uh, have a component and you want to render something different depending on how much space you have available, right now your best, uh, your best option is basically to render a placeholder view and then component did mount, you can measure it and decide what you actually want to render and then you have to re-render um, and so now you're, re you're rendering twice. And you have to do the same thing uh, if you want to vary uh, your design based on how much space a piece of text takes up or things like that. And so our idea for solving this problem is what if layout was done in React? Now this probably sounds crazy to you. It sounded crazy to me at first. Um, but let's, like, let's take a look at what this would mean. And so by layout in React, what do I mean? I mean that when you're in your render function for your component, you would have layout information available if you want it. You could say, you know, if the width is greater than 300, then render this, otherwise render that. Uh, and this very easily uh, fixes the reflow problem because now you can just render the correct thing the first time. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to render a placeholder and then, uh, and then replace it once you know how big it is. Uh, this also makes windowing simpler because now in React you already know the layout of everything so it's super easy to, uh, or it's at least a lot easier to not render the things that aren't going to be on screen. Uh, one really awesome optimization that this would unlock is you could skip the creation of what we call layout only views. And you know, if you take any modern web app like Facebook or Google Docs or anything, uh, and you inspect the, the DOM, you'll see a whole bunch of divs, and a lot of them, you know, a lot of them have borders and backgrounds, but a lot of them don't, and don't really render anything. They're only there to group other elements together, um, and if you didn't actually have that div, uh, but the children were in the same place, then it would look exactly the same, and it would behave exactly the same. And so I actually did an audit on uh, Facebook.com. I tried to count uh, how many of the divs were these layout only views and 60% of the elements on the page weren't actually doing anything. I mean, they were there for layout, but then the browser needs to keep track of them, it needs to do event handling on them, it needs to do all these things uh, that it really shouldn't have to do. And so potentially we can get rid of, uh, we can get rid of these nodes completely, uh, which will make the apps a lot faster. And the last uh, amazing thing that this would unlock is that this lets you build new layout primitives. Um, and I'm sure you all know how much of a pain it is to lay things out in CSS, especially you know, if you're using floats and absolute positioning, it's hard to get things exactly where you want them and to make it work well cross-browser. Uh, Flexbox is a lot better and it's, uh, it makes it a lot easier to build the layouts that we, we typically see, uh, but uh, we're still waiting for browser support for, uh, for a lot of cases, and, uh, and even Flexbox doesn't let you do every layout you want. It has no support for aspect ratios or grid layouts and things like that. But if we have all of the layout information in React directly, that means you can build your own layout components, and you wouldn't need to wait for browsers to implement Flexbox or anything like that. You could just build your own stack layout component or grid layout component or you know, Pinterest layout component, and uh, build exactly what you want and have, uh, build your own abstractions for layout. So that's the user experience piece. Now I wanna talk about developer experience. There's three things that uh, we really wanna improve with the developer experience. Uh, and the reason is, you know, partly that we're lazy and as developers, we want our lives to be better, we wanna spend less effort building these apps, but Partly, it's the main reason is that focusing on developer experience means that you guys can all build apps faster than you would otherwise. And when you can build apps faster, that means you can build higher quality apps because you're not wasting time uh, trying to build things that you shouldn't have to worry about. So the first piece of this that I wanna talk about is just the new project experience. Um, this, you know, if you're lucky, you've never had to make a new project in React and you've only worked it, you know, with your company's uh, web app that's already set up for you. Uh, because honestly, right now, it's a big pain. Uh, because if you want to use the latest tools, you need to know Node and NPM and Gulp and Webpack and Babel. You need to set up all of these uh, before you even start writing any code. 
Now, you, you don't have to. Um, in fact, our official React tutorial um, doesn't use any of these tools. Uh, or it, it, uses, it uses Babel, but just as a script tag in your page. You don't need to install anything. But uh, people tend to, to use these. Um, thank you. Uh, people tend to, to use these tools when they're, they're building apps. And the reason, you know, it's not that these tools aren't useful. They all solve real problems. These tools are especially helpful when you're trying to build large apps. Um, and they help you scale up. But, uh, but along the way, we've lost a lot of the web simplicity where uh, you could just take, a, take an HTML file and open it in any browser without having to install anything. So what we'd like to have, you know, ideally, you should be able to just create a single file for your app or you know, for your root component and then just run that and without having to set anything up. And so our ideal dream of this is you should just be able to create your app.js file and then you know, do like react run platform equals web and that'll just open your browser and run the app and you don't need to set anything up. And you would also be able to say platform equals iOS or platform equals Android and that would start up the mobile simulator. And so what I want is that you can quickly prototype with one file, but then over time, when you actually want to use these tools because you want the flexibility they provide or you're trying to scale up or build a, uh, you're optimizing for performance in production, then you can add them. But you shouldn't need, to, you shouldn't need any of these in order to, uh, to just get started. The second piece of developer experience I want to talk about is just dev tools, which is you know, sort of could encompass all of the developer experience part, but uh, there's a few dev tools that I want to call out that I think are really, really awesome. The first um, is just our official React dev tools. Uh, most of you have probably seen it. If you haven't, then there's a link in your console saying, please install the React dev tools, and <laughs> you can click that. You know, it lets you inspect the, the tree of elements. Uh, we now have it for both Chrome and Firefox, um, and it really makes it easy to see what's going on in your React apps. Uh, the second piece I want to talk about is tools like React Hot Loader and React Transform, which make it possible to edit code in your editor and save it and then see the changes in your browser or in your, uh, in your mobile simulator without even reloading so you don't lose any of the state and you can see your changes instantly. These are really cool. And <coughs> we also have... Uh, we also have IDEs that people are building, like New Clyde is one from Facebook. There's also a great one that was on Hacker News like two weeks ago called Deco, um, which is an IDE that's built for React Native. And these make it really easy to see information about your components in line with the code. They make it easy to change your styles and see the results of those immediately right in line with your code. So you don't even need to leave your editor. And all I want to say about this is these are all awesome. We love these. Please build more like these, um, and you know, we'll try to support you as best we can. Now, the third piece of developer experience is data management. Um, and people have a variety of uh, ways to do data management in their React apps. Um, most people start with uh, just React built-in set state, and that's a great place to start. It's super simple. It takes literally two lines of code in order to get state into your app at first. Um, but uh, you know, it keeps all of the state encapsulated in your component, which is really easy and convenient when you're getting started, but because the state is all trapped in your component, that means if you want to share it with another component, it's kind of a pain, and you need to wire a bunch of things up uh, so that you can, you can share that data properly. And so as people grow their apps, lots of people turn uh, towards uh, Flux or Redux, uh, where you pull data out of your components into these centralized stores, and this is really great for large apps. You can access those stores uh, from wherever in your, uh, in your applications, but with Flux and Redux, uh, server communication is basically completely up to you. Uh, they, don't, they don't have anything built in for that. Um, and also, there's just a lot of more setup you have to do uh, before you can use these, because you need to set up the dispatcher and the action creators and all these, all these different pieces. Um, and the third piece of data management that's super popular, um, at least at Facebook, and not yet in the open source community as much, but it's definitely growing everywhere, um, Relay is a great piece of software. It makes it super easy to get data from your server into your components. And what it lets you do is write exactly which data you need 
for each component right next to the definition of that component. So you don't need to you know, go change your server to add the data and then call an API somewhere in your store and then go to your component and use that data. It's literally you know, 10 lines away. Um, we call this co-located queries. Um, we think it's a big deal, it's awesome. Um, we're using Relay a ton at Facebook, um, but as you most of you probably know, uh, Relay won't work for you if you don't have a GraphQL server, and most people don't have GraphQL servers, unfortunately. I think it's a great idea. Um, but most people don't have that yet. And Relay also uh, doesn't help you that much if you have a lot of client-side data uh, that you want to manage that doesn't have any counterpart on the server. And so uh, these solutions are all good. They all, they all have their own pros and cons. And so we'd really like to find a middle ground between the the three of these, ideally, it's super easy to get started. It's, we can get the best of all three of these, make it easy to move between them. And code reuse uh, is, I guess, really uh, where the developer experience piece comes into this. You know, we want, uh, we want it to be, you to be able to structure your applications, and we want to encourage you to structure your applications in a way where it's really easy to reuse any part of them. And so that could be just the data layer, and you're swapping out the UI, that could be you're reusing the UI and swapping out the data layer and powering it by something else. Or you should be able to just use the UI and the logic together and take one component and just display it in another place in your application, you know, maybe in a modal or uh, wherever you want it. Um, and so we think this is really important. Now, speaking of code reuse, I, I want to go back to uh, talking about React Native and the, our ads manager app that Nick Schrock talked about in uh, in the first talk today. Um, now this is what the two apps look like. This is our iOS and Android uh, ads manager app. This lets you uh, create ads and manage them if you're an advertiser on Facebook. Uh, this is our first uh, app at Facebook that's 100% React Native. Um, and if you look at these two apps, they're pretty similar. You know, they, they're not exactly the same. The iOS one has the tab bar at the bottom, and the Android one has the hamburger menu. Um, but each one of them matches the platform conventions, and so it feels, so the iOS app feels like an iOS app, and the Android app feels like an Android app. But if you squint, they're pretty similar, and like Nick said, we are sharing 90% of the code between these two apps. This is a huge deal. Now, we also have, uh, it turns out, a mobile web version of the same app, um, and this shares a little bit of the data layer. It doesn't really share any of the UI code, uh, but it has basically the same feature set and the same goals as the native apps. Um, and you, know, you can see this also lists the ad campaigns that you have. And so we already have React Native for iOS and Android. And so I'm thinking, what if we also had you know, a web version? And what would that mean? You know, that wouldn't actually mean that much for you when you're developing uh, you know, you wouldn't need to change your workflow that much. It would just be instead of div and span and IMG, you'd have text and view and image. Um, and, you know, just as the iOS and Android applications don't share 100% of the code, the web probably also wouldn't. But why shouldn't we be able to share the inside parts? You know, it would look something like this. And you have basically the same app on all three platforms sharing 90% of the code. Uh, now, this is just an idea. I know you all probably want this to exist. It doesn't exist, um, but hopefully this is uh, hopefully this is inspiring. We want we want this to happen. We know you want want this to happen because now instead of you know this really can transform the engineering organizations because instead of uh, your iOS team and your Android team and your mobile web team, you can just have one team and it's basically like you have three times as many developers now. So. You know, I just solved Silicon Valley's hiring problem, right? <laughs> so, how are we gonna get there? You know, like I said, all of this stuff is stuff that we're thinking about for the future, stuff that we'll probably build eventually, uh, but it's even better if you guys can build it. Um, and, you know, we're a huge fan of all the open source work that's been going on. Um, you know, right now, React uh, is version 0.14, uh, but it's been production ready and stable since, uh, since 2013. Uh, probably a lot of you saw the, our blog post on, uh, on Friday that our next version is going to be called 15.0. Uh, 
Uh, we're really doing this just because we looked back and realized that basically all of the versions of React that we've released so far are already production ready. We've been using it in production. And so really it should have a version number above 1.0. And people are already saying React 13 and React 14, and so now they can say React 15. Uh, so we're going to release a release candidate for React 15 next week. Um, in the DOM version, we have uh, now full SVG support for any tags and attributes you want. Uh, text nodes in the tree now don't have uh, spans wrapped around them. We have, we're using HTML comment tags instead. Um, so you won't ever see them show up in events or in, uh, in your CSS rules. And we're also getting rid of the uh, no script tags when you return null and replacing those with HTML comments as well. Um, now, one, another awesome thing that the new versioning scheme lets us do is it lets us release uh, new minor versions more often and get new features to you guys sooner. Um, and also in this release, we have a bunch of internal re refactors. Uh, we got rid of uh, React IDs completely, so if you inspect Element now, you won't see all that. Um, and, <laughs> and React's also about 10% faster. Uh, a big part of that is because we got rid of those IDs. Um, and now, you know, I just wanna, and with, uh, with a few more numbers, um, you know, if you look at how many people committed to React and React Native, we had 300 people committed to React um, in 2015, 600 people committed to React Native, so like you couldn't even fit all those people in this room, and that's awesome, I think. Um, you know, we have 36,000 GitHub stars, total vanity metric, but I think we're doing okay there. Um, and I just wanna repeat uh, that number that Nick put up, which is, you know, we don't have a great way to know how many people are building using React, but Google does tell us how many people are, have the Chrome DevTools installed, and we have 225,000 people with the Chrome DevTools installed, uh, which means that hundreds of thousands of people are building stuff with React. I feel comfortable saying that, and that is mind-blowing to me. Um, and it's not all numbers, also. We have some really great projects uh, that people have built. So things like Redux and Material UI and React Router and Enzyme, all of these are great projects that solved problems we weren't even really looking at. And so, like I said, we want you guys to keep doing this, building awesome stuff, and so uh, please just take this talk as inspiration and build more awesome stuff. Thank you.